this uh, picture up here, as anybody who knows me knows that I would rather be outside than anything. <clears throat> this is my office right there. You girls recognize that place? It's not too far from your house. Uh, that's uh, on Twist Road. Uh, <clears throat> now you recognize it. Uh, I've, uh, I love to spend time outdoors, and uh, shortly after I came to Amboy, this became one of my favorite spots to go pray and study. And uh, <clears throat> now with the technology that we have, uh, a lot of my Bible reading, Bible study is done in places like this. Uh, and uh, we've got these things called the, uh, let me see, I push uh, that button. There we go. Um, <clears throat> you use one of these things. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure what the difference is between them, but uh, uh, <clears throat> I, I have learned to uh, <clears throat> and figure out a lot of things here and try to help you out. When, I'm going to give you a couple of vocabulary words today uh, and we're going to get to in a little bit but this is uh, where we live <laughs> that's the skyline of Amboy uh, you know I, I love I grew up in a small town actually grew up out in the country next to a small town of 200 people uh, the town that I grew up in and uh, <clears throat> there were 15 of us in Fritzville we called it uh, growing up and uh, they actually had a sign on the front of our house Fritzville population 15 uh, but uh, the uh, town of Amboy has just become home to us we've been there 25 years and I just love to uh, get up in the early in the morning as the sun's coming up and this time of year especially get on my bicycle and find out which way the wind's blowing I'll ride into the wind for an hour and ride back from the wind for an hour and no matter which direction I go <clears throat> it's country and sometimes I'll see more deer than I'll see people uh, when I'm out there I just love it uh, and uh, just love being out in a small place our his uh, our church has got a uh, interesting history. I'll show you a couple of pictures uh, about us. And of course, uh, no matter where you are, uh, you can do something for God. This is uh, downtown. Uh, if you see three cars lined up at an intersection, we call that a traffic jam. All right. Uh, and uh, this is downtown Amboy, Illinois. And uh, you can do something for God no matter where you are. You can build a bus route in a place like that. You can have a Sunday school uh, program. You can have a great church. Uh, and uh, folks are different in a small town than they are in a big town. Uh, one of the men Wednesday night came to church and I uh, was, uh, you know, at least you wore a collared shirt tonight, the church. Didn't have a tie on, but at least he had a collared shirt. But the collared shirt was camouflage colored, uh, which was my favorite color. Uh, but uh, folks in small town think different. And here's a couple of our young people dressed up for Sunday school, right? Uh, <coughs> right? Uh, <laughs> Uh, that came compliments of your mom. <clears throat> they just got done or just getting ready to crawl in some clay caves and climb in some rocks or something uh, when they got that picture uh, taken. But this is uh, our church. As our church was started 1855 uh, in Amboy, Illinois as an independent fundamental, Bap oh, they weren't called fundamental, independent Baptist church. Uh, and uh, that was before the fundamentalist movement. Uh, and this building uh, is their Actually, their second church building, the first building where they started was in an old schoolhouse building that can't find a picture. Nobody knows exactly even where the building stood. Uh, but this was uh, built in 1857. Uh, that building burnt down in uh, about 1921 and 2022. And in 1923, they built this building. And the building right next door to it is currently the parsonage where we live. And it looks pretty much just like that still, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, in a small town, if folks have said, well, you, don't, if you live in a parsonage, which I wouldn't necessarily suggest that uh, to a lot of folks, uh, better off to build some equity in your home, but that's just the situation we're in. Uh, and uh, folks say, well, don't live right next to church. If I'm in a small town, doesn't matter if you're right next to the church or across town, two blocks away across town. Everybody knows who you are. Everybody knows where you are, uh, where, you, where you live, uh, and uh, they know everything about you. Uh, and uh, we absolutely love it. Uh, if you don't have any secrets from folks, uh, you can feel perfectly comfortable with that. Uh, that's our current building. It looks a little bit different 
than when it was originally built. Uh, and we've got a big building in the back uh, of it. It's actually a pole barn decorated real nice with classrooms and a gymnasium and offices and things in the back. Uh, and we did have a Christian school for a while, but that's uh, pretty much in, in, in the heritage, the history of our church has got some amazing things in it. If I had time to uh, go through some of that, but uh, uh, it, 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 we've got a rich heritage in our community. The town uh, actually, when our town incorporated as a city, uh, the only meeting place in our town was our church building. Uh, that church building, you said, that's where the townsfolks met to vote to become an actual city. Uh, and we're part of the community. And uh, the devil has tried to attack, tried to destroy, and do everything he can to defeat our purposes, which is to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, uh, I'm... Uh, I see I've got some notes here, but I'm not following them. I'm going to see what I'm leaving out that I don't want to leave out. Um, when I was saved, I, I grew up in a Lutheran background. And uh, when I got saved, I decided uh, after salvation that uh, going through the battle of baptism, following the Lord and believers baptism with my own family, and I want to know what the Bible had to say about baptism. I just got in the habit as a new Christian of finding the word, in this case, the word baptism, following it all the way through the Bible, and going only strictly by what the Bible says. And, uh, by the way, that's a good way to study the Bible. Uh, and uh, it wasn't too long after that, I, I tell people when I got saved, I was a Baptist by convenience. I got saved and baptized in a Baptist church, didn't know anything else but a Lutheran church and a Baptist church. Uh, after I started digging in the Bible and learning some things about history, I became what I call a Baptist by conviction. Uh, I believe that uh, Baptist doctrine, they're champions of soul liberty, or I prefer to call it soul responsibility. They're champions, I believe, in the King James Bible only. Uh, I believe in the local church only. In fact, the history of our church, I've got an old book that our church, uh, uh, I put it out a number of times, published uh, it a number of times, our church when it started in 1855 said, we are Baptists as defined in the Encyclopedia of Religious Knowledge. And uh, after I'd been to the church for a few years, we were in the process of rewriting our Constitution. And I kept saying, I wish we had a copy of our original Constitution. I didn't realize at the time churches back then did not have constitutions. They had a Bible and that was enough. Uh, but they did have doctrinal statements. Uh, they did have church covenants. Uh, and someone who was coming to our church at the time gave me an old book uh, that I said on a shelf, that's a neat book. It gives me old Bibles and things once in a while. He said, oh, that's a nice museum piece or something. And I got looking at this book one day as I was working on this, and it said, Encyclopedia of Religious Knowledge. That's interesting. And I opened the book and found out that it was published in 1840. And I looked up Baptists and found an amazing article about Baptist history written in 1840 and a section on what Baptists believe, who they are. And uh, I thought, wow, this church is exactly, when it started, what we are today. Uh, for a while they weren't that way, uh, but we've gotten back to what we once were as Baptists. And I want to talk to you about the doctrine of the church tonight. I'm going to give you a couple uh, this morning. A couple of uh, uh, words to define a couple of uh, uh, things that I want to look at concerning the doctrine of the church. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus uh, answered and said unto Peter, Thou art Peter, or Simon Barjonas, uh, for flesh and blood is not revealed unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell should not prevail against it. Jesus is building his church. I believe that there's nothing on the face of the earth more important to God than the church. And I say the church, I'm talking about a local church, not some invisible magical kingdom out there. That's a Catholic doctrine. That's not a Bible doctrine. Uh, the church is a local assembly uh, gathered together. Uh, and let me just, I, I want to teach a whole lesson on this, but I'm just going to mention uh, by way of introduction, if you study the word church uh, in the Bible, uh, you find there's uh, the, the, actually two different words, church singular and church plural. 
you'll find that 80 times the word church is referred to in the Bible. And many of those times it's referring to an individual church, the church at Corinth, the church at Ephesus, uh, the church at Philippi, uh, the churches of Thessalonica. But it, then uh, you'll find that 37 times the word church is plural uh, in the Bible. Uh, speaking of a number of churches, now that kind of messes up your whole theology if you're of this persuasion of the Catholic idea of the universal church. Uh, and, uh, but uh, the church, I believe, is a local gathered out assembly. It started with Jesus Christ when he assembled his disciples, uh, called them together. Uh, and uh, churches, and I believe that the hope of America is found in local churches. Uh, and I think that uh, I don't have a problem with that. I don't think anybody here has a problem with that, a misunderstanding of that. And I think that the hope uh, in, uh, in our state, in our nation, is to every community, we, sad to say, the community of Amboy is unique in the fact that we have a good, solid, fundamental Baptist church in our community. The hope for America is to get a church like that in every little community. And I want to challenge you to consider... Going to a small town, when we started, uh, actually we prayed about starting a church, there's seven communities around us that are at least twice the size of our community. But you would think of them as small towns. Princeton's one of them. Uh, and I want to see a church started in each of those little towns. To us, they're big cities. I mean, they got traffic lights. We don't have one of them. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> they got uh, McDonald's. They got Walmarts. Uh, we don't have any of those things. Uh, and to us, they're big, but they don't have a church. Uh, and we helped Brother DeLotel start. Uh, we started the church down here and sent them down to, to pastor the church eventually. Uh, but uh, the two words I want to talk about to you today, and we've got to get this squared away in our mind. I think we've got the idea, the doctrinal idea, but I'll just give you some practical thoughts concerning two words. And the words are autonomous and indigenous. Uh, I'm sure you studied those words when you talk about a local church, a local assembly. Uh, autonomous and Indigenous. What do they mean? Uh, let me just give you a definition. This comes from Webster's 1828 Dictionary. Uh, I'm not sure at the 1828, if that's the year, that's the weight of that dictionary, uh, for those who have them, but uh, that's a great dictionary to use. Autonomous means this, uh, that they're independent in government. Uh, they have a right of self-government. There's no hierarchy. There's no big brother over them. Uh, they are literally the body of Jesus Christ. Oftentimes I'll tell folks that people say, well, if Jesus was walking in the streets of Amboy, hey, Jesus lives in Amboy. He's the head of the First Baptist Church, and we're his body. Well, we're walking down the street. We're the body of Jesus Christ. Uh, we are his body. We are him. Uh, the Pope is not God, uh, but we are, as an assembly of believers, uh, the body of Jesus Christ in our community. And I believe that every uh, church is an autonomous uh, body. And again, the word church is in the Bible, plural. Uh, and uh, I learned this as a young Christian. When you outgrow the local church, you just outgrew God. Some of you get this idea, well, we got this big ministry. It's bigger than the church. You just out, outgrew God. Uh, and well, this movement, this college, or this whatever we've got, uh, this uh, ministry is bigger than our local church. I believe every ministry, if it's biblical, is under the authority of a local church. Uh, and uh, we have, to be quite honest with you, lost sight of that in our generation with the uh, independent fundamental Baptist churches. Uh, the fundamentalist movement is not a Baptist movement. Now, I listen to often uh, fundamental radio state, uh, what is it, the uh, Fundamental Broadcast Network, one of my favorite preachers on there. They got some old-time preachers on there. <clears throat> Bob Jones Sr. That's Bob Jones Sr. And, uh, I want you to know that Bob Jones University, uh, we preach what, what the Bible says is so except when it comes to the doctrine of church and baptism. No, no, he doesn't say that. He ought to say that. <laughs> but uh, I believe that the Bible is so when it talks about the Bible and baptism as well. Uh, and uh, <laughs> but, uh, I, 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 I think that, you know, I remember telling 
Brother DeLo tells us. I, I use him because you know him. When he got out of Bible college, he came to work with us, and eventually we sent him down to pastor in Princeton. I said, you know, the greatest thing, the greatest blessing to you, your ministry, is when you get over your Bible college. I appreciate this college, and I'm grateful for this college. We've got two students here, I'm grateful, but uh, your college is not bigger than your church. Uh, and uh, your church, and this college is not more important than Fairhaven Baptist Church. Uh, and uh, God is, Jesus is the head of the church, not the college, not the movement. Uh, I'm a little leery of religious fads and movements. You know, if you study the history, you find out that when the fundamentalist movement started, Baptists, many of them were opposed to it because they saw something that was bigger than the church, that was inclusive of something that we don't want to be a part of. Uh, and uh, we believe that the autonomy of the local church. Now, the other thing that I want to look at, the other word, uh, and, and let me say this, when, where I went to Bible college, there are some things that were just accepted. And again, I, I went, I got saved one year, the next year I was in Bible college. I didn't know any of the Bible, the Bible stories that I did know, I thought they were fairy tales. I didn't know they were true stories. Uh, I didn't know there was any history behind the Bible. I remember going to Old Testament survey history class and they talked about the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom. I was in school in Missouri. I thought they were talking about the, the Civil War. I didn't know what they were talking about. Uh, I didn't know the difference. Uh, I, I really didn't know anything about the Bible when I went to Bible college other than the few things that I heard growing up uh, as told as nursery rhymes or something. Uh, and uh, I went to school and uh, uh, the school I went to uh, uh, split off of J. Frank Norris's group uh, and uh, the Baptist Bible Fellowship School, which I, somebody asked where you went to school, I got used to saying the wrong one, but uh, folks that get hung up on their Bible college, they went to their, but I remember going to college and I didn't know one thing from another and they talk about J. Frank Norris, now who's he? Uh, but they, I mean that was a cuss word, J. Frank Norris, you can talk about him. Uh, because they split off of his group to start the, the BBF. Uh, and I didn't, and years later I read about him, and this guy wasn't all bad. He had some good things about him. He wasn't exactly what I would recommend or be, but uh, pastored two of the largest churches in America at the same time, one in Michigan and one in Texas. Back in the 50s. <laughs> I don't know how he did it. Other than he had Brother Enzinger up in uh, Michigan that, really for all practical purposes was a pastor up there. Uh, but uh, here's some amazing things. Uh, and yet, because of where I went to school, we weren't allowed to talk about him. No, either. There's some great people out there that can contribute a lot to your ministry if you let them. Uh, now, let me go on to the next thing here. Uh, and uh, the word indigenous, what does that mean? Indigenous. It means native born in a country, applied to a person. I brought something with me today. <clears throat> I didn't finish my breakfast. <clears throat> I had the pear, but I didn't eat this yet. We know what that is? What's that? An orange. Aren't you glad you're here today? <clears throat> but, uh, that's an orange. You know, I, I love to spend time outside. I love to garden. When I was actually a teenager, I grew up in northern Illinois, and I grew an orange tree. Uh, and I put it in a pot inside the house. Actually, it was a tangerine tree, close enough. You wouldn't know the difference. And after a few years, because it was in the house, there were no bees to pollinate it, I hope. Uh, as I walked around when it was, uh, uh, when the, uh, it was in blossom with a little paintbrush and pollinated the, the thing itself, and actually grew some of these. They were much smaller than that. The biggest one, probably about the size of a ping pong ball. And you peel it, and it was kind of nasty tasting, but it was pretty cool to have an orange tree. And I thought, well, this thing's getting big. I'm going to plant it outside. It did great in the springtime, the summertime. Uh, I think it even uh, blossomed. I don't think it ever uh, grew any oranges or tangerines outside. But what happened that winter? <clears throat> I left it outside. What happened to it? That tree froze. Oranges don't grow in this area. They're not indigenous to this area. They're not going to survive around here. Now, if you come to live in a warmer part of the climate, and that's really what the word is referring to, it's indigenous, it's something that's uh, 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 acclimated to the climate that it's in. I mentioned earlier that small town people think different 
than big town, big city people. Uh, if you're from a small town, you know exactly uh, what I mean. Since I've been here, I uh, just driving to church last night, the thought hit me <clears throat> on the highway out here. You got these holes in the road, potholes. Now, to us, to hit holes like that, you got to go off the road where we live to hit those kind of holes. In fact, you got to go in the cornfield to hit those, some of those holes. Uh, they're not on the road because we don't have the traffic that you do and the trucks that go by constantly and, and, and wear out the roads. And, uh, you know, the, uh, the mentality of people uh, in small towns is just more laid back. Uh, you can just, uh, you know... You don't have to sit in traffic for an hour a day. You can go out and sit in your yard and talk to the Lord for an hour <laughs> and then walk next door to work. Uh, and uh, you're just more laid back and uh, uh, more, uh, I guess, uh, a different mindset with folks. And let me just, I'm going to keep these words up there and talk to you about a few things for a few moments. I believe that we need to get back to this understanding of being autonomous and indigenous. Um, a preacher friend of mine was talking about a church in a small town in our state that a pastor came there fresh out of Bible college and he's going to do something for God. I'm going to turn this world upside down for God. I'm going to knock on every door, win everybody to the Lord. He had the biggest campaigns and, uh, you know, the three-legged man and the smallest man and the tallest man and all these things that attract a big crowd. Within a two-year period of time, everybody in town had made a profession of salvation. And his church had grown from 25 people to 25 people. But now everybody in town saved. And he said to this evangelist, my ministry's over. I've done reached everybody I can reach. But nobody's in church. There's something wrong with this picture. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I, when I came to Amboy, I determined I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to knock on every door in our town. I have 2,400 people in, t in town. That's take, I easily get that done. I'm going to do it every year. I found out I didn't get halfway through the town in the first year because I found out when you knock on the door, oh, the reverend's here. Come on in. Let's have some coffee. Let's have some tea. Uh, could you stay for supper? Uh, and that's just the way people think. Uh, and uh, you can talk to them about politics. You can talk to them about religion. But when you talk about salvation, well, uh, I think it's time to go now. Uh, and, uh, but that's just the, the mentality of people. The more laid back, and they tried to you know, convince me to join the ecumenical crowd and uh, with the uh, Father Becker and Mother Martha and Boy Brant, uh, the three churches in town. Uh, <clears throat> so I called the, <laughs> now Father Becker was, I mean, he was God in our community. Uh, have you ever heard of uh, um, Elgin St. Edwards College in Elgin, uh, the big Catholic school over Boylan Catholic College, uh, Catholic school in Rockford, the two big, uh, some of the biggest schools in our state. Uh, Father Becker started those schools. Uh, and then he came back to Amboy, he's an Amboy boy. Uh, and he came back in retirement to pass it, and he had an article in the paper that everybody wrote and, uh, or read, and uh, he was a psychiatrist or whatever that is, and, uh, uh, and uh, he was like God to everybody. Oh, we need to have Father Becker at your church. No, I don't think so. <laughs> He's not my father, <clears throat> first of all. Uh, and, uh, but people think differently, and to reach those people is going to take, and let me say this, that uh, the pastor, two pastors previous to me, fell into sin. To me, uh, unpardonable or un, uh, un, uh, unthinkable, unmentionable sin in, in mixed company. Let me just say this, that he lives, uh, I have talked to him, I've never met the man, I've talked to him on the phone a couple of times, and I use him for illustration because he did more for the glory of God than any other pastor in our recent history before me. But he also did more for the destruction of God's work than any other past. Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. And I asked him when I talked to him on the phone, what was it that put, took you from point A to point B? And he gave me the same answer that every Christian's ever given me. I didn't have time to pray. Didn't have time to study the Bible for myself. He's now living with his boyfriend in, in Florida. If he comes to the state of Illinois, there are still uh, warrants for his arrest in the state of Illinois uh, because of sins that he's... In a small town, 
that's devastating to a church. Uh, and uh, he left town uh, because the sheriff said, you either get out of here. And people in the church had no idea this was going on. There were rumors going around town, but you hear all these rumors and you just ignore them. Uh, the sheriff said, you get out of town uh, by tomorrow or I'm going to arrest you tomorrow. He went on a two-week vacation, never came back. Uh, and uh, we had that reputation to live down. Plus, being in a small town, he decided, we're just going to be here, and one of my favorite words became real, R-E-A-L. I'm just going to be a real Christian. Nothing to hide, nothing artificial, nothing phony. Let folks watch me. Let folks see me. And that's the way people in small town, you know, you're not going to knock on somebody's door and first time contact win them to the Lord. One folks to the Lord uh, on their doorstep, they're few and far between, but it's usually after many visits to their home. Uh, usually by that time you've gotten in the home or they've come to church, but uh, it, it's different in a small town. Uh, and uh, there's some things that you need to, and I've learned to dig into our church's history and our church's heritage and use that. Uh, every five years we have an anniversary, and I usually send a, I update our history article and send it to the newspaper. They'll usually put it in the paper with some pictures, the pictures that I showed you. Uh, they'll put them in the paper sometimes. To, to promote, and, and people like in small towns like that, and you can put the gospel in there with it. Uh, and, uh, but you come to a small town and folks, they may not dress the way you want them to dress. They may not wear their hair exactly the way you ought to. They might have the standards that you have uh, in, a, in a larger church. And eventually you build them up to it. We have a young lady that was in our church. She was actually a teenager when we came to the church. She's a preacher's wife now, uh, serving the Lord and living for the Lord. She sent me a thank you note. There was a, uh, something I, I saved, some of these things. I, I think I saved that one. I uh, stuck it in a file to sometimes, uh, you might want to go back and see them. She said, I want to thank you because you came to my basketball games at the public school even though you knew I wasn't dressed right. And you encouraged me as my pastor even though you knew I wasn't living right. You know, and a lot of friends that I have say, what's God, I ain't going to go there. Look at the way them women dress to play basketball. I just be an encouragement to them. Uh, and uh, when we first came to town, I was sharing this, I think with Brother Ramos before the service, that we put our, our two oldest boys that are now adults, one of them going to the mission field, we, we put them in the public school. At that time, it was still a public school. Now I call it a government school. They let us come in and teach Bible classes. They let my wife volunteer to be a teacher's aide and help out with it. Uh, one of my, my son in the first grade was having some difficulties with a certain situation. Uh, his teacher said, uh, well, before we go out, he was afraid to go outside because of the tornado warnings of the wind. That was Nathan. You guys were teasing him about that, all right? Uh, whenever there's wind blowing outside, there's going to be a tornado. We're all going to die. You know, chicken little, the sky's falling or something. Uh, and uh, the teacher said, well, before we go out for recess, let's have prayer together. Praise the Lord. Now, it eventually got to the point where, yeah, we can't do this anymore. Things started to change. And now I wouldn't think of doing it. But uh, when I'd say that, well, our kids go to the public school, they do what? Uh, some things that work in this community might not work over here. We need to be autonomous and indigenous. There's some things that you can accept that will work here, but not over there. We have a food pantry in our church. Uh, that is a, a great blessing. Would you believe if I told you that some of the liberal churches in our community send our church money for our food pantry ministry? And by the way, when they come to get food, they also get a gospel track. And they also witness to them. I say, well, you compromiser. What's the matter with you? Accepting liberal churches' money for the food. Uh, I, and it's a great need in our community. Uh, and uh, folks in town respect that and admire. Now, what I'm saying in, in the, this age of electronic stuff, I don't, I'm trying to work this thing. I'm not sure uh, how to do all this, but uh, we've recently tried. I, I, I'm not sure as long as they set it up for me, I can figure out. We've got a screen in our church, and sometimes I put pictures or verses or announcements and things up there. And uh, personally, 
I, any new advancement in electronics, I go in kicking and screaming. I don't want anything to do with it. Uh, and uh, I refuse to put a video game <clears throat> on my, I, I don't even call it an iPad, I call it a Jesus pad. <clears throat> but uh, we've got too many eyes, <clears throat> too much eyes, too much me stuff. But uh, uh, and it's not even an iPhone, it's a telephone or my other's phone. But, uh, uh, but, uh, uh, but we need to, if there's resources, the ability to use those resources, use them for the cause of Jesus Christ. And don't get so set, well, this is the way we did it in the college. And we mentioned, uh, Brother Ramos mentioned that a lot of folks come from a big school, a big college, and they go to a small town, and they're like, you know what we did back there? It doesn't work here. You know there's a recurring nightmare that I have. In fact, I had it last night. Two of them, in fact. One of them, it's been, well, I don't know how many years since I've been at Bible college, but I have a nightmare. I didn't have this one last night, but I do have this one once in a while. I dreamt I was in Bible college. That's a nightmare, isn't it? Uh, and I dreamt that it's half hour till class starts. I'm rolling out of bed. I've got a paper due today that I haven't started yet. Is that a nightmare or reality to you? <clears throat> But the other nightmare that I had, and I did have this one last night, believe it or not, I woke up and realized I'm a pastor of a church, and I've got a church staff, and we've got a meeting in a half hour. <laughs> I don't have a church staff. I don't know what I do with a church staff. I don't know what they, I don't know, go out and mow the lawn or something. Uh, what do you do around here? Uh, I'll clean the gutters off the building. I don't know. Uh, and uh, I wouldn't know how to handle a church staff. Uh, I, I joke sometimes, a few years ago, I heard the, uh, a larger church said, well, we have a weekly staff getaway where the guys go off and go fishing or something. I said, you know what? I like that. I'm going to have a weekly staff. Every year, I'm going to take a week-long staff getaway. So I load my bicycle, I load my kayak, my fishing pole, and I go away for a week. That's my staff getaway. Uh, and I love it. Uh, and the mentality is so different then, uh, and you come from a large church and a large ministry with all these things going on, and you come to a small town, oh, what do you do here? Well, you reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. What I'm saying is, and I guess I could tie it all together in just uh, a couple of statements here, we need to make sure that we know what this book says and hold tight to what this book says. And my son's going to be a missionary to an African country. When they go to Africa, they're not going to go there and say, all right, we're going to start, this is the 4th of July Sunday, we're going to start the service by standing and saying the Pledge of Allegiance to the United States. They're going to say, what? And then we're going to sing, God bless America. What? Yeah, we're sometimes that foolish when it comes to, you ought to know what the Bible says uh, and live by what the Bible says, live and die by this book but be willing to do whatever is necessary to reach your people. Do whatever is necessary to reach your people without compromising what this book says. Now, sometimes we need to determine, is that what the book says or is that what my upbringing, my culture, uh, my college, my home church, whatever, taught me. You know, when I came to, to Amboy, I, I believe that the Lord wanted us there. It took me a little while to convince my wife. She said, what are we going to do down there? <clears throat> What's down there? Well, there's people down there. I believe God's called us down there. Uh, and uh, this is the place that God has for us to serve. And we'll do our best to serve the Lord Jesus Christ there. And we'll do whatever we... Oh, I remember we, we were down there for a few right my... my We've had one child since we were in Amboy. She was born in Amboy. That's all she's ever known. My youngest, or my oldest daughter, we had two boys and then two daughters. Our, our daughter, Rachel, she's married and has two children now. But she was, I guess, about two years old when we came to Amboy, so she hardly remembers our home church. We went back to our home church for a meeting, and it's, our home church is a larger church with, uh, I think, about uh, eight or ten bus routes and a big Christian school and everything. We walked in the building, now she's a few years older, to, I think she's maybe about first grade age or so, and she was looking around and said, what is this place? 
<clears throat> this is where mom and dad got saved. This is where we met. This is where we got married. This is our home church. This is where we left to come down to Amboy. Uh, and she looked around again and said, why did we ever leave? <clears throat> well, because it's where God called us to be. Uh, and to be quite honest with you, I feel a whole lot more comfortable in that small town where folks are maybe a little bit more backwards than what we're used to, but uh, we love it there. And things that uh, maybe would have worked at one place won't work at another place. Uh, and uh, we need to hold the Bible tight. We need to be willing to do whatever's necessary to reach the people God's called us to. And we need to learn the difference, again, between what God says uh, and uh, you know, what we do. Isn't, you, know, you look back, and I, I love to study history. I've become kind of, a, because of the age of our church, I said, try, started studying the history of our church and, and digging more into Baptist history. And, uh, you know, you go back in history, you find out that these folks that we hold up as great heroes of the faith, they would have never met our hair standards at Fairhaven Baptist College. Huh? They would have never dressed. I want, you don't want to know what kind of music they listen to. They would have got demerits for it, I'm sure. <clears throat> but you know what? God used them in a great way. Maybe we've evolved more or something. I don't know. Uh, I hope not. But, uh, we, but that's the different culture that they lived in. Uh, and and uh, we need to be autonomous, indigenous, find out what works. And uh, our, our missionaries, and, and by the way, I, I was a missions major in college, and we emphasize being indigenous and knowing the culture. I remember one of my missions teacher talking about being a missionary and this is in the 70s, uh, 79, when I first went to, to Bible college. He recently had, been, uh, had to leave the mission field. He's, he was in Persia, what's called Iran today. Uh, and uh, the, uh, I, uh, the Shah of Iran, and Ayatollah, no, Shah, Shah of Iran, uh, different things were going on in that culture, and I really didn't uh, know exactly what was going on. But he had to leave that country. But he talked about when he first went there. And he said, this music that these people listen to is driving me absolutely crazy. Oh, there's minor, and in the Middle East, the music that they have there is different than what, they're not going to sing, oh, victory in Jesus. I'm going to be like, what in the world is that? They're not used to that kind of singing, that kind of music. And he said that I, I, I try to sing the songs that we're used to in America. I had a hymnal and trying to sing. They can't sing these songs. We don't, we don't sing that way. And they play the music in the public squares, and, the, and it's just kind of, it sounds like death or something. Uh, and uh, he said, this, this is just wrong. And he started preaching against it. You're going to sing the right kind of music. And he thought, that ain't getting anywhere. <clears throat> He's losing people that are saved. And he said, you know what? And he started doing a study, and he said, you know, this music that they listen to goes back thousands of years. We're talking about the Middle East here. In fact, the tunes that David probably played were more like that than what we're used to. Hmm, that's interesting. But we get so set in our culture. Now, I'm not saying that we're going to start a rock band tomorrow or anything like that. You understand what I'm saying. Within reason, within uh, biblical guidelines. Again, know the difference. Is this the Bible? Is, you know... No red-blooded, normal man likes to wear one of these. Right? <clears throat> I told somebody the other day, I, I almost got it yesterday. I stopped over at Bass Pro Shop and saw a camouflage one. <clears throat> I'm going to get one one of these days. But I'm one of these guys that doesn't spend $10 on a tie. But uh, <clears throat> that's too much for me. And it was $19 on sale. That's still too much. But uh, I'm cheap, all right? Uh, and... Uh, <laughs> Small town mentality. Uh, because when you buy something, it's got to last 20 years. Because you're not going to... Never mind. Uh, but uh, <laughs> well, that's just a Bible college mentality, maybe. I don't know. But, uh, but we got to learn the difference. Is this my culture saying that? No, I dress with a suit and tie. I don't believe Jesus wore a tie. Well, if he's here today, maybe he would. I don't know. Well, I... You dress according to your culture, what's respectable. And I, I've done this as an experiment, just going out knocking on doors years ago. I went out with a dress like I am now. 
Uh, I, the next day, I would go out without the suit coat on, just the shirt and the tie, uh, and britches and shoes, too. But, uh, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and then uh, the next day, I'd go out with just uh, with no tie and no jacket. I was amazed at the difference in the response that you get by people when meeting a complete stranger. And I think that those things are important. And you're going to be a Christian, you ought to wear the uniform of a Christian. Uh, but you, uh, we ought to be aware of what the difference is between our culture. And don't get so set in our culture, in our ways, in our, sometimes, our own philosophies that we forget this book that we share. We need to take this book, what's unchangeable, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the truth of the word of God, that's unchangeable. And we need to transfer that from the pages of this book into the lives of those that we minister to. In a small town, you're probably, as somebody say, well, are you a full-time pastor there? I hope to be sometime. Uh, I've got a couple of side jobs. In fact, somebody a couple of asked her if my wife would come. Well, actually, she had to stay home because uh, I've been managing an apartment complex and somebody's moving in, so somebody had to be there to give their keys and things. Oh, you pick up things. Whatever it takes. Well, I'm not going to go there. Bless God, I'm going to trust God to, to, to uh, uh, meet all my needs. Well, you're going to have to go to a bigger city probably. Or you're going to get real hungry. Uh, if that's the place that God's called you to, uh, you need to do everything you can to stick to this book and to make ends meet however you can. Uh, and... Uh, Stay true to the word of God, uh, but be built, willing to do whatever's necessary to reach those people with the gospel of Jesus Christ and learn the difference. Uh, am I just holding this because that's what I was taught in college or is that what the Bible? Am I, you go to a good college uh, and I'm assuming what you're taught in college does come from the Bible, right? So are you afraid to answer it? No, I'm just... Uh, <clears throat> but, uh, you know the difference. Is that my preference or is that a biblical standard? Uh, and make it fit into your culture. Autonomous, indigenous. Uh, otherwise, we're going to be like, I'm going to go out in my yard tomorrow. I love oranges. I'm looking forward to eating this one. I just, I, I saved it long enough so I can show it to you. I'm going to eat. It's not going to make it home. Uh, well, it will, but it'll be in here uh, when it gets home. But I love oranges. I'm going to grow one in my backyard. It ain't going to work. No matter what I do, it ain't going to work. In fact, we got an apple tree. Your little brothers <clears throat> helped me out with that. Uh, we had some problems because of the weather and things in our backyard at, uh, this year. I thought, boy, I, I'm, I'm going to, you know, the Bible talks, Jesus gave the parable, of you're going to dig it and dung it. I'm going to do everything. I'm going to cut this thing all the way down and try to start it because it hasn't produced for a couple of years. I'm going to get one more chance uh, and see if it produces apples. I'm going to be scriptural about this. Uh, and... Uh, uh, and in the springtime, it had all these blossoms on it. Looks like, and the little apples were forming. And then I, every once in a while, someone will blow off the wind and things. And I thought, well, something's wrong here. I don't know what it is. Uh, but the, the apples are disappearing. I don't know where they're going. And finally, I found uh, <clears throat> one day, I've got a playground in our backyard also next door to the church. And some little boys, I won't name, some of them have the same last name as you guys. Uh, and some other little kids were out there playing. Uh, they are hiding in the playground, and next to them was a pile of apples about that big around. It was the middle of the summertime, with one little bite out of them. <clears throat> and they bite them and throw them down. This one's sour, too. <laughs> you little rats. But, uh, uh, <laughs> boy, I'm saying, you know, sometimes I, and, uh, Put an electric fence around there with 440 volts. And uh, next time is what I'm going to do. But you do whatever you can. But uh, I'd like to have an orange tree in my backyard, but it's not going to work because they don't grow around here. Uh, they may grow if we do it a different part of the country. They'll work just great. Uh, and uh, but around here, you got to find what works, and you can still produce fruit. It might not be exactly the the orange kind of fruit or the banana trees and uh, uh, different things, but uh, you know, find what's indigenous to your community uh, in the place that God calls you and uh, be willing to hold this Bible. Don't let go of the truths of the Bible uh, and do whatever's necessary to reach your people without compromising this book.
that we have. Father, we pray that you would bless these young people. I thank you for this time that we've had to share with them. And Lord, we uh, just pray that you would <clears throat> help each one of them to, to find and determine to do your will for their life. And Lord, we live in a great land that's got great needs, a sinful day that we live in today. Lord, we need more preachers to hold the Word of God up high and to not compromise in the truth of the Word of God and yet to do whatever we can to reach this lost generation with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray that you would bless each of these young people as they seek your will for their life uh, and uh, give us a great day now in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. God bless you.